Uh, we have two conferences. Yes. Uh, uh, Gunther Soler uh, uh, from the uh, Ludwig Maximilian University of München. And then um, Frederick Rauscher uh, from the Michigan State University. We are going to begin with the lecture of uh, Gunther Soler with the help of uh, uh, Marcela, Professor Marcela Garcia. Please. Republicanism, Federalism, Democratism. Kant, Friedrich Schlegel, and the Enlightenment Discourse about Perpetual Peace. Texts without contexts are blind, contexts without texts are empty. <laughs> the early modern discourse about perpetual peace goes back to the proposal of Charles Irene de Saint-Pierre, along with its reintroduction by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, to establish a league of Europe's political leaders together with a standing body of the representatives as a formal forum for addressing and settling international disputes prior to and in circumvention of the outbreak of open warfare. The continuation and conclusion of the peace discourse by Immanuel Kant, zum ewigen Frieden, henceforth perpetual peace, and following him, Friedrich Schlegel, several decades later, reflects the changed political realities on the European continent under the impact of the French Revolution and within the equally altered politico-philosophical horizon of republicanism, federalism, and democratism. The three parts of the presentation address the introduction of republicanism along with federalism in Montesquieu and James Madison, its redefinition in Kant, and its fusion with democratism in Schlegel. First part, Montesquieu and Madison on republicanism and federalism. Independent of, and in part even prior to, the peace projects of Saint-Pierre and Rousseau, Montesquieu's De l'Esprit des Lois provides an analysis of the workings of law and politics in modern times that exposes the anachronistic nature of bellicose and hegemonic thinking in foreign affairs, given the commercial community between the sovereign states of modern Europe, which, on Montesquieu's analysis, form a de facto federation and constitute one great republic or one nation composed of many. In particular, Montesquieu considers Republican federalism a modern means for combining the self-governance possible in small sized republics with the international standing of a powerful territorially extended state made up of a sizable number of such member states. Montesquieu introduces two farther features into his comprehensive account of modern statehood. For one, he moves liberty in its double sense as a state's constitution, constitutional independence, political liberty, and its citizens' personal liberty, civil liberty, to the center of assessing a state's political and civil constitution. This comes especially to the fore in Montesquieu's celebrated, but by no means unqualified, praise of the unwritten English constitution. Moreover, Montesquieu replaces the classical exclusive linkage of civic and political liberty to the Republican form of government with a view of modern monarchy as entirely able to afford its citizens liberty, provided the monarchy's absolute power is mitigated by intermediary institutions and powers, such as the jud judiciary and independent because landed nobility, or an independent because increasingly capitalist third estate. Conversely, for Montesquieu, neither ancient style republics nor modern manner monarchies have a secure claim to safeguarding civil and political liberty and are always prone to deteriorate into unlawful arbitrary rule despotism. Montesquieu's double focus on civil and political liberty and moderate, if not constitutional monarchy, has a direct bearing on the prospects for lasting peace in the modern polity. In particular, the indirect institutional inclusion of the people in modern monarchical government through such representative bodies as the estates or a house of commons, essentially charged with co-authorizing the monarchy's finances, involves the people in decisions regarding the financing of war and peace, which are accordingly no longer made from dynastic interests alone, but in consideration of the common good. In addition, 
Montesquieu's nested conception of modern Europe as a nation of nations and as a quasi-republic of sovereign states lends the modern European political order the character of a federation in which military confrontation between member states is no longer a justifiable means of international politics, but a case of civil war proscribed by law. The juridical political model for Montesquieu's inner, inter and supranational view of modern Europe is the past and presence of the Holy Roman Empire as a federation of increasingly independent states held together by joint institutions such as the Imperial Diet and the common legal tradition of imperial public law. Montesquieu even uses the term Federal Republic of Germany to designate the old empire's composite yet unitary structure, thereby anticipating by two centuries the name of a fourth miniature successor to the old empire after the undoing of the second German empire at the end of World War I and that of the third German empire in World War II. Against the background of Montesquieu's novel analysis of past and present regime types and their ambient, ambient conditions, the climate on a global scale, the other mid 18th century contribution to po modern political thought, Rousseau's Du Contrat Social, seems particular and provincial in its take on the modern polity. Deriving his political perspective from his hometown, independent free Geneva, and his intellectual horizon from the Greco-Roman twin legacy of the polis and the res publica, Rousseau shows surprisingly little consideration of, or even interest in, the political and juridical conditions of modern statehood, government and citizenship that involve a large territory with a diverse population and a burgeoning economy. To be sure, Rousseau's nostalgia for the pre petty polis of early classical antiquity, prior to both Athens and Sparta forging powerful competing empires under the guise of federations for mutual benefit, proves the fountainhead for not a few extremist political theorists and practitioners, among them the radical democrats of the French Revolution. It is not Rousseau's nostalgic republicanism, but Montesquieu's vision of a modern federal republic that inspires the designers and drafters of the American constitution, who seek to turn the 13 loosely confederated sovereign states formed out of so many former colonies into a more perfect union. In particular, Madison and Hamilton, in their political philosophical article series, The Federalist, defending and defining the proposed US Constitution, draw on Montesquieu for the careful calibration of the, of the branches of government and for the ingenious joining of the Republican and federal forms of government. The tie-in of the United States founding as a federal republic into the 18th century debate about perpetual peace is twofold. Internally, the new federation demonstrates the deliberately and freely undertaken entrance of previously sovereign states into a higher level composite entity with a strong central government, in addition to the preserved decentral governments of the semi-sovereign member states. Internationally, the American experiment turns a collection of small and weak newly arisen polities into a unified yet diverse republic, sufficiently strong or at least growing to become so, to compete in a global arena of large-sized monarchically ruled world powers. Further evidence of the intersection between the American constitutional debate and the European debate on perpetual peace is the journal article entitled Universal Peace, published in 1792 by one of the Federalist authors, James Madison, the later fourth president of the young country. Building on his definitions of the Republican and federal forms of government in Federalist 39, Madison changes the emphasis of the Enlightenment Peace Project from its long lasting character, eternal, to its comprehensive scope, universal. In addition, Madison critiques Rousseau and Saint Pierre, without mentioning their names, for having conceived perpetual peace as resulting from 
and resting with a league of princes. By contrast, from Madison's own essentially Republican and Federalist perspective, universal peace hinges on two alternative constitutional and institutional requirements. In order to be amenable to international peace, any monarchical government has to be republicanized so that a concerted consideration of the people's good or the common good in all decisions reg regarding war and peace is assured. If the government is already in the hand of the people or rather its representatives, the goal of universal peace requires in addition to the achieved republic republicanization of the government, the yet to be accomplished republicanization of the people, their civic education to transcend partisan pursuits in favor of the cognition and recognition of the common good, especially in matters of war and peace. Second part, Kant on federal republicanism. Three years after Madison's slender journal article, Universal Peace, appears Kant's contribution to the contemporary debate about a comprehensive and permanent peaceful international order. Due to Kant's stature, his small book on the topic lends to the lingering peace discourse in Europe, renewed vigor and revived, revived momentum. Among the 27 reviews of perpetual peace on record from the first two years after the work's publication, stand out Fichte's contribution from 1796, together with a review published by Schlegel in the same year. Under the immediate impact of the French Revolution's international military and political fallout, Kant in perpetual peace widens the previously rather contained debate about perpetual peace to a wider discussion of the role and requirement of republicanism and federalism in political progress at the national and international levels. Moreover, Kant moves the discussion from the customary prudential and pragmatic level involving diplomacy to the philosophical level in involving juridical concepts and political principles. In spite of its high level of abstraction and complex philosophical conceptuality, perpetual peace is also more concrete in design and execution than earlier contributions to the debate. In particular, Kant's interven intervention takes the outward literary form of an actual peace treaty, arranged in preliminary and definitive articles, supplemented by various appendices in the matter of an actual diplomatic document. To be sure, as specified in the work's subtitle, the treaty provides only a sketch. Kant's peace opusculum is not an ordinary treaty between particular parties to be reconciled after some previous bellicose encounter. Rather, perpetual peace features a super or meta treaty under the guise of a fictitious omnilateral universal agreement addressed to all possible war parties and designed to end all war. While the philosophical substance of Kant's meta treaty in perpetual peace is as genuine as it is original, the outward form of a treaty into which Kant clothes his perpetual peace project is a literary device continuous and consistent with the tradition of early modern peace tracts undercut by the deviant use of some of its standard features. In particular, the very title of the work, Zum Ewigen Frieden, is not a straightforward indication of the work's intent and object, as corroborated by the work's opening satirical anecdote about an inn located near a cemetery, and hence called Zum Ewigen Frieden, in the customary German language practice of forming an inn's name by prefacing it with the directional preposition zu, contracted with the ensuing definite article, zum, zua, depending on the gender, to an educated speaker of German, the title phrase zum ewigen Frieden does not convey what the book is about, as in the actual descriptive titles on perpetual peace, of perpetual peace, or about perpetual peace. Instead, the title Zum Ewigen Frieden has the semantics and pragmatics of the English locution, the perpetual place, construed along the lines of the name for a pub in English, e.g. the Eagle and Child. Further evidence of Kant's satirical intent behind his meta-treaty 
is the inclusion of a secret article, customary in peace treaties of the time, and here devoted to a secret agreement on the part of politics to consult philosophy in questions of war and peace, as though the politicians would be too embarrassed to openly admit the philosopher's say in the matter. To be sure, the satirical setup of perpetual peace does not detract from the work's serious political philosophical intent, which it rather salvages by means of, it will, of its willful playfulness from the usual dismissal of being mere theory and being useless in the face of recalcitrant practice. The three definitive articles that make up the core of perpetual peace are devoted to the three areas of public law distinguished by Kant, state law, people's law, and cosmopolitan law. In matters of state law, perpetual peace's fictitious contract stipulates the republican character of a given state civil constitution. The claimed conduciveness of a republican constitution to the general maintenance of peace consists in the presumed reluctance of a politically empowered citizenry to carry the material and immaterial burdens of warfare. To be sure, the involvement of the people under a state's Republican constitution is attenuated at best. In particular, for Kant, Republicanism resides not in a state's system of rule, which is either monarchical, aristocratic, or democratic, but in the manner in which the people is ruled through its head, which according to Kant is either Republican or despotic. The despotic government is defined by the non-separation of the government's legislative and executive powers with law giving and law application being united in the same physical or moral person and the state's public will being turned into an arbitrary private will. By contrast, the Republican mode of government is the institutional separation of the state's legislative and executive powers. Again, for Kant, a state's Republican mode of government is factually and normatively independent of that state's system of rule, which may well be monarchical and even take the form of, of so-called enlightened absolutism rather than English style constitutional monarchism. For Kant, being a Republic is neither necessary nor sufficient for a state to enjoy a republicanly minded mode of government. While the notion of separating the legislative and executive power is already to be found in Locke and Montesquieu, the identification of these features as specifically republican is original with Kant, as is the conceptual severing of a republican civil constitution from a republican form of state. Two farther related features stand out in Kant's monarchy compatible quasi-republicanism in politics in general and in peace politics in particular, its representationalism and its anti-democratism. Kant mandates the form of government to be representative. To be sure, representationalism required by Kant does not consist in the recent democratic device of popular representation constituting the legislative power, but in the formal delegation of the executive power to an institutional body different from the supreme legislator. Kant's executive rather than legislative representationalism is even explicitly directed against the state form of democracy, in which on Kant's analysis, the people as such wield all political power to the point of resulting in democratic despotism. According to Kant, political progress over the still prevailing monarchical regimes does not consist in a democratic revolution but in incremental reforms that ever more approximate a given state constitution to the possibility of republicanism. Kant even enter entertains a scenario of a state still formally constituted by a despotic ruling power while governing itself already in a republican manner. He ambitions the populace of such a partly despotic, partly republican state to steadily, slowly acquire the civic habit of lawful obedience out of the very idea of the law's authority rather than through despotic force. With a quasi-Republican requirement of ex executive representationalism in place at the state level, Kant moves on to expound the juridical political requirement for an international peace at the interstate level. Point of departure is the analogy that obtains between individual human beings living next to each other in the unbound freedom of the state of nature 
prior to the civil condition of lawful freedom and individual states existing alongside each other in a natural state as well. While in the sphere of state law, Kant recognizes an unconditional command for human individuals forming a people to enter into a civil state, there is no comparable categorical command in international law for individual states to give up their independence with regard to each other and enter into a super state, people's state, Völkerstaat, of ever expanding extent until reaching the confines of a world republic. On the contrary, for Kant, the very idea of the law of the peoples as a body of law presupposing independent states and governing their egalitarian interactions prohibits the systematic successive suppression of plural political peoples in favor of an increasingly unified and universalized polity and its homogenized people. Accordingly, Kant substitutes the juridically prohibited and undesirable people's state with a people's federation, Völkerbund, under the guise of a peace federation, Friedensbund, designed to end or obviate not a particular way war, but any and all war. The federalism so envisioned is free in the specific juridical political sense of operating without coercion and preserving the political freedom of a state for itself and at once that of other allied states. In Kant's scenario for perpetual peace in international relations, the lengthy and fallible peace process takes its beginning from a state that is already under a Republican constitution, hence prone to peace within and without, with which other similarly oriented but still politically developing states increasingly associate themselves in a widening circle of Pacific partners. Unfortunately, Kant does not explain any farther the political dynamics behind such an alliance, designed not as usual for bellicose purposes, but for the very opposite aim of lasting and comprehensive peace. Also, Kant leaves open the juridical political structure of such a peace league and does not clarify its ambiguous juridical status between a loose confederation and a better union, to quote from the preamble of the US Constitution, ratified seven years prior to Kant's tract, but completely ignored by Kant as a model for federative republicanism at the international level. Third part, Schlegel on democratic republicanism. Schlegel's rejoinder to Kant's perpetual peace in the essay on the concept of republicanism lays the focus entirely on the concept of republicanism and its relation to despotism as well as democratism. Two features remove Schlegel's contribution to the peace debate from its precedent in Kant. First, Schlegel's philosophical horizon in the essay on the concept of republicanism is as much shaped by the early Fichte's transformation of Kantian philosophy as by Kant himself. In particular, the essential function of practical ideas in political philosophy, while prepared in Kant's conception of the regulative use of ideas, follows closely Fichte's affirmative account of, an, of human activities perpetual striving. It is also to the early Fichte that Schlegel's essay owes the core conception of the I in general and that of the communality of the I in particular. The Fichtean overcast of Schlegel's reception of Kant also accounts for the formal fusion to be found in the essay on the concept of republicanism of a priori pure and a posteriori empirical considerations in political philosophy. A conception of political philosophy that deeply immerses reason into history and diverges sharply from the neat separation between the two as prized and practiced by Kant. The second feature that alienates Schlegel's essay from Kant's perpetual peace is the former's sustained orientation toward political history in general and Greek political formation, politische Bildung in particular. The essay on the concept of republicanism forms part of a series of works by the early Schlegel that take up the late 17th and early 18th century controversy 
over the respective merits of ancient and modern literary, artistic, and civic culture. Unlike Kant's specifically modern embrace of natural right and public law, Schlegel's fervent republicanism reflects an anti-modern affirmative immersion into classical Greek political history and culture. Schlegel's political neoclassicism shows already in the status he accords to political philosophy. While Kant's political modernism treats political philosophy as applied philosophy of law, entirely subordinate to the latter's specifically dual normativity, Schlegel regards political philosophy in the manner of the ancients as a field of philosophy sui generis, next to ethics and replete with its own principles. Accordingly, the strictly a priori status that Kantian political philosophy acquires by its derivation from public law is replaced in Schlegel by a blend of purely rational and entirely experiential considerations, which introduce history, specifically ancient political history, as an essential evidential basis for political thought and action. At the methodological level, Schlegel's empirical rationalism leads to the adoption of approximation rather than instantiation as a manner of realization for political concepts and principles. In particular for Schlegel, the key political philosophical concepts of republicanism and democratism function as futural fictional devices that serve as a fully functional substitute for perfect political principles in the absence of the latter's adequate realization. Specifically, with regard to republicanism, Schlegel maintains the entirely acceptable stand-in function of majoritarian democratic will for the completely counterfactual general will. Far from considering democracy a form of despotism and incompatible with representative republicanism as Kant does, Schlegel regards democracy as a probate political compromise in the service of Republican principles and ends. With regard to despotism too, Schlegel reverses Kant's indictment by accepting, exempting temporary tyrannical rule from the charge of despotism. In addition to reversing both the Kantian disjunction of republicanism and democratism and the Kantian conjunction of democracy and despotism, Schlegel also departs from Kant's prohibition of political revolution by permitting insurrection as a means for removing a despotic regime. The political philosophical dissent between Kant and Schlegel culminates in their divergent assessment of the conditions of possibility for perpetual peace. Kant ties the advent of lasting and widespread peace to the twin principles of republicanism and federalism, joined by a natural teleological mechanism that nudges human beings to political progress. Schlegel objects to the merely partial peace brought about by a Republican federation that would leave out both the uncivilized nations and the despotic states as continued objects and sources of warfare, respectively. For Schlegel, truly perpetual peace requires a worldwide universal and perfect republicanism. Moreover, for Schlegel, the guarantee for eventual perfect peace cannot reside in some inscrutable ruse of nature, but only in savvy statecraft, drawing on past political experience that discloses the laws of political history and the principles of political formation. While the essay on the concept of republicanism leaves open the means that political history, including ancient political history, replete with war and conquest, offers for the successful rep republicanization and federalization of all of humanity, Schlegel's subsequent biography and bibliography reveal his inclination to a politically as well as confessionally Catholic authoritarianism that seems quite at odds with the enlightenment twin ideals of republicanism and federalism, which are so pervasively and persuasively featured in Kant's political thought.
Thank you, Professor Sola. Thank you, Marcela Garcia. And we have 10, 10 minutes for discussion. Please, uh, more questions. Efraín. Yes. Oh, so, so thank you for your paper, Kunta. Uh, I, just, I wanted you to, to elaborate, if you can, on what you don't mention in the paper, which is, I take it, the cosmopolitan uh, law proper. In other words, I understood you, you gave us a context and the texts of uh, the first and second uh, definitive articles. But there's no mention on, I mean, you, I think you, you mentioned it in your, in your paper, there's no treatment of cosmopolitanism. And I just wonder if you have uh, something to say in that respect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Efrain. And thank you also for allowing me to participate in this format, and I apologize to uh, the colleagues present in Mexico City for not having been able to come in person. It's a very important uh, further perspective in Kant's own thinking about these matters, and also, of course, in our contemporary perception of uh, international relations. There is, though, a more, let us say, humanitarian aspect to the cosmopolitan law uh, segment of the public law in Kant that has to do with rights of visiting, with in modern discussions of migration, extent of stay, degree and mode of hospitality and such things. And while this is essential for international relations, it is, I think, less essential as such for the war and peace perspective in which I was looking at these authors, beginning in Montesquieu, going through Madison and Kant, then into uh, Schlegel, and accompanying their own experiences of warfare from the mid 18th to the early 19th century. In that perspective, uh, it is rather international law and the implications that that has for um, people as a whole, not so much for individuals that matters. So that also the migration perspective that we could bring into this cosmopolitan level from our current uh, situation to me is less the perspective of individuals, but the perspective of displacements of entire segments of populations, ethnic groups and such things as a result of political international conflicts and as a result of geopolitical developments rather than uh, the specific local events that might drive individuals to go to the shores of Europe or uh, of the United States. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question? Uh, maybe related to this question, uh, related to uh, Ephraim's question. The yes. question of the cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan is, is very, very strong and very, very actual related to these problems of migration, refugees, and so yes. on. And the question is uh, why is this uh, question uh, not so important by Schlegel? I would say that the historical realities are different. There is also a material, so to speak, vehicular basis to migration, means of transportation and uh, ways of getting from one place to another across expenses of land or of sea. And migration of that kind is a relatively recent phenomenon on one side, and of course a much older phenomenon with the migration of Africa into Eurasia, Asia into Europe and so on, uh, thousands of years ago. But it's a recent development, again, in the aftermath of geopolitical developments along the lines of war and peace, that entire people have been uprooted and relocated in the way that populations were relocated after World War II, for example. 
Poles that had to go east so that Russia could move uh, into the west, or had to move west so that Russia could move in. Then the Poles moved out the Germans. The Germans squeezed and moved out uh, in their own country. So developments like that are a reflection of prior big international developments. And I think that's the important perspective to address these. And they were not part of the horizon of um, um, the time of Schlegel and Kant, except of course, in the form of colonialism at the time. And that's an entirely different issue now, how to treat colonialism in a partly imperial and partly commercially uh, defined context. Um, I would like to ask you, thank you so much for your paper. Uh, and thank you for reading it. You did a great job reading it. It was thank you. very easy to follow. I, I tried. <laughs> so I'm really interested in this paragraph where you speak about Fichte's influence on Schlegel. And I want to ask you if you could say a little more about specifically how there, there's a couple of aspects that I'm interested in that you mentioned, right? First of all, the distinction between Kant's regulative use of ideas versus Fichte's perpetual striving and, and mm -hmm. exactly how that, you know, how you see that changing Schlegel's perspective. And then the question of the I and the communality of the I. And yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that will have something to do with the understanding of demo democratism. Uh, yeah. So I, if you could yeah. say a little more, I would be grateful. Mm -hmm. I'll take up the last uh, thing you mentioned first. There is really a, quite some agreement uh, between the more radical political views in Fichte and in Schlegel compared to the much more conservative, although liberally tinted views in Kant. Now to the questions themselves. Regulative in Kant in its opposition to constitutive uh, reflects a certain um, mitigation and moderation. And once it's turned into the notion of striving in Fichte, it becomes again constitutive, constitutive of the interplay between infinitude and infinity in the development of the eye, but also in the development of other things at a social and even at a natural level. So in that sense, then it's a re-rendering constitutive in this case of what seemed to be in Kant only regulative. And the point about the I and the we, um, would be that at no point does Fichte think of the I in uh, egoistic and solipsistic terms. It's always a third person philosophical category in him, unlike in Kant, the I. And as a result of that, there's also no real contrast to the we. It's rather that the we brings out the intersubjective constitution of this uh, generic uh, form of uh, subjectivity. And with both of those things in place, the whole setup of social and political philosophy becomes much more, as these romantics themselves would say, organic, as opposed to the uh, individualist, and in that sense, almost analytic procedure that uh, Kant has in building up his political theory and philosophy of law also from I and you, from mine and yours, as far as possession is concerned. So that's uh, quite a different methodology that you could contrast as individualist on one side and holistic on the other side with all the dangerous implications that this holism can have because there are holisms like nationalism, racism, and so on that are much less uh, desirable in this advance you want to put it that way, in Fichte and Schlegel, than uh, the more proto paleo liberal stand in Kant. Can, can Thank ask you for the interesting question. Yes. So can I ask you a follow-up? I, I find this fascinating yeah. because we're living in a time where there's a sort of sort of reaction against that classic liberal individualism, it seems. And do you think there's a version of this holism, this organic understanding? that avoids the dangers? Or would you say, no, we have to go back to Kant and then avoid the dangers? I would say there is a way of going forward to Hegel to bring in yet another author. 
and now I'm seemingly at the wrong conference. I think that Hegel's distinction in the philosophy of right between civil society, Gesellschaft, and state, where they're not the same as in Locke, but differentiated, distinguished, even opposed, and he calls the state in that sense then political state, der politische Staat, und die bürgerliche Gesellschaft, or civil Gesellschaft. That is a way of allotting equal importance to the individualist, liberal, and the more holist, substantialist in Hegel uh, tendencies in uh, the modern political setup. But of course, in Hegel too, with dangers about being at least perceived as totalitarian on the left side and other such things. Thank you. Okay, another question? Okay, thank you, Professor Sola. Thank you again for facilitating this and having me uh, join you at the conference. Thank you. And, uh, Professor uh, Rauscher, Frederick Rauscher. Oh. Thirty minutes and then for discussion. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I have a handout uh, which provides an outline of my paper, so that you can just. Look down, skip right to the place where you will most disagree with me. <laughs> Ignore the rest of the paper. It saves time by doing it that way. For the, uh, I assume, tens of thousands of people on Zoom, you don't have a copy of the handout. So you are obligated to pay attention to the entire paper. <laughs> so I apologize. Uh, so my paper is uh, Content International Courts. Um, at one point in the Doctrine of Right, Kant says of a judicial court that, quote, whether such a thing exists or not, does not exist is the most important question that can be asked about any arrangements having to do with rights, unquote. In the perpetual piece, I'm now altering the translation, thank you. He points out that without any international institutions, states wanting to pursue their right cannot appeal to, quote, legal proceedings before an external court, unquote, but only to war. And yet when Kant discusses institutions for international right, he makes no specific mention of any kind of international court. How could there be any international arrangement having to do with rights if there is no institutionalized court? In this paper, I will assess what Kant's views might be on some of the specific types of international courts found today. I will forgo entering into the debate about whether Kant ultimately prefers a single world state, a state of states, a looser league, or some other form of international relation. He certainly thinks in the doctrine of right that at this stage in history, the looser permanent Congress of states is the best feasible option. This voluntary international league falls short of a state of states as a coercive international entity with individual states as subjects, and is also different from a single world state with coercive powers over individual citizens as subjects. Either of these options, a world state of state or a single worldwide state, would have coercive powers with the judiciary. But in a league of states, without the full apparatus of a coercive overarching entity, how would a court or a judicial role function? This question is important because this sort of international system is exactly what we have right now. This paper will first examine some roles of the judiciary in Kant, and then look at the three requirements for judiciary and how they affect international courts today. I will argue that some, but not all aspects of international courts today meet Kant's requirements. Section one, the role of courts in Kant. The judiciary is described in three different places in the doctrine of right. First, and most generally, it is understood in terms of distributive justice as the third part of public justice, the other two being protective justice, actual law giving, and justice in acquiring from one another, which is determining rightful possession of objects. 
It is here that Kant describes the existence of a court in the quotation I started with as, quote, the most important question having to do with rights. The function of the judiciary is to specify rechtens, or what is laid down as right, the specified right, as, quote, the decision of a court in a particular case in accordance with the given law under which it falls. Here, the range for court decisions is only on specific applications of given law. That's key. Second, earlier in his discussion of private right, Kant devotes chapter three to acquisition dependent upon a public court of justice. While giving four specific types of cases where such a decision by a court is needed, contract for a gift, contract for lending, contract for recovery, and taking an oath, you might remember that section. Kant claims that the court is a moral person that replaces the judgment of individual human beings about their own affairs with the court's objective judgment. Individuals' judgments would be based on their own view of what is right in itself, while the court decides strictly on the basis of what is public or what represents the united will of all. The court ignores any claims about any natural expectations of an individual for their natural right. And here, the expression of the objective public will rather than a private will is key. Third, the judiciary is listed as one of the three authorities, Gewalt, which is another way of translating that word, uh, within a state where he says its function is, quote, to award to each what is his in accordance with the law, unquote. The state is a unified entity with three aspects, each of which expresses the will of the people in different ways. The legislative authority, executive authority, and judicial authority are each necessary for a state. In particular here, the, the judicial authority requires a legislator to issue laws for the courts, and an executive to enforce judicial decisions. And since we have already identified the material for the court must be given laws, here the coordination of the judicial authority so that its decisions are enforceable is key. So we have the following roles for a court in Kant. First, it concerns application of given law to specific cases. Second, it represents the will of the people as objective judge. And third, it must be part of a system including enforcement. I will now look at each of these three roles in turn in relation to the current international system. So first, specificity in, in, in international law. Current international law contains some explicitly codified rules, particularly those set out in treaties, but also contains two kinds of uncodified rules customary law, and opinio juris, or the generally accepted view of what is right. Much traditional international law is of the uncodified kind and to, is to that extent indeterminate. Kant would hold that these uncodified rules for the behavior of states are part of natural right, but not positive right. They are not simply arbitrary or artificial, but stem from reason as a way to regulate the behavior of states. Kant himself offers various rules to govern warfare in a state of nature among states and offers a principle that states must not engage in behavior that would make peace itself impossible. But since a court must use positive right, Kant would not support an international court's use only of natural law or determinative or as determinative or binding. We have seen already that the domestic courts have the role of specifying in particular cases what is laid down as right, or rechtens. Their role is to apply the positive law created by the legislative authority. International courts that apply specific rules from treaties would to that extent be endorsed by Kant. So certainly some of the actions of international trade courts created by treaties like the World Trade Organization or the International Criminal Court basing their rulings on the laws, uh, the rules that lay out crimes of war or crimes against humanity as laid out in the Rome Statute of 1998 would to that extent be considered legitimate by Kant. Those decisions would be based upon promulgated rules agreed to by the states. Any court that used uncodified rules, however, 
would fall short of the judicial role that Kant invokes. He rejects equity as the basis for any court's decision. Courts must make their decisions based on the, on the basis of public right, not on the basis of any perceived view of right. While some might think that international courts can legitimately make decisions based on moral principles, Kant would reject that move and insist that courts must have positive law as guidance. As writer Malik says when he argues for a similar point, quote, the policy implication for increasing the legitimacy of international courts is not to make judges more moral, but to build international legislative organs to match the growth of the international judiciary, unquote. United Nations resolutions occupy an ambiguous middle ground here between specific positive law and more general claims about right. The UN is an international organization created by a treaty and particular UN resolutions can be as specific as positive laws. But since particular resolutions are not legally binding, except those of the Security Council, they would not have the status as positive law that Kant seems to require. Perhaps Kant would allow an international court now to include these resolutions as part of its reasoning regarding application of other specific rules, but not to base a binding judgment upon them. And likely, Kant would hope that in the future, the UN is strengthened to be able to provide legally binding rules. Specificity also arises in international law in relation to human rights. Lists of human rights, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948, are often used as a basis for human rights claims, but are notoriously vague. Some might think that courts have the function of specifying these rights. Alex Stone Sweet and Claire Ryan in their recent Kant inspired book, A Cosmopolitan Legal Order, while acknowledging that Kant says little about a judiciary, develop a Kantian based account of rights protected by international courts. One key feature of their account is a proposal that, Kant, that courts at the domestic and international level be authorized to invalidate laws by invoking not only positive constitutions and international charters of rights, but also something like Kant's principle of right. But this sort of judgment by a court cannot be called Kantian. Kant could not accept a court making judgments upon so vague a standard as the principle of right. The court must have some particular rules on which to base its judgment. And since ju court judgments based upon customary international law or opinio juris fall short, he would certainly reject the even more general principle of right. Next section on objective judgment. The second aspect of the judiciary in Kant is that it must reflect an objective public judgment rather than the particular judgment of individuals. In the case of an international court, a particular judgment would be one reflecting the determination of only one state or even a handful of states, such as when one or more states condemn the action of a different state that they perceive violated human rights or laws of war. If the judgment is issued only from the government of particular states, then it reflects the judgment of that state using natural right rather than any objective judgment. In order for an objective judgment to be made at the international level, there must be some institution that reflects the will of the whole set of states that will fall under the jurisdiction of that court. To illustrate this issue, consider the claims to universal jurisdiction by domestic courts in particular states, such as Germany, that extend jurisdiction past the boundaries of that state to cover any perceived violation of basic law anywhere in the world, particularly in order to enforce crimes against humanity. Kant would have to oppose claims to universal jurisdiction because the relevant scope of the people whose judgment is being invoked by a court is only the people who share a particular political system and any resulting judgment would reflect the particular, although for that people omnilateral will of the people forming that state. A people cannot impose rules upon, uh, sorry, a people can impose rules upon itself, but not upon other peoples. 
there must be a codified international law that identified a particular court with jurisdiction and the jurisdiction of that court extends only over states that had agreed to the rules and to the court. This claim is related to Kant's view that individuals should always be subject only to laws they give themselves. Objective judgment in international law would presumably have to reflect an omnilateral will extending across the peoples and states of the world. Since all the particular worldwide international institutions that we now have are the result of multilateral treaties, these institutions reflect the voluntary cooperation of those states as individuals and do not represent the whole of all states or all of the world's people subordinating themselves to a single sovereign entity. To that extent, they are multilateral rather than omnilateral and none of them can be said to reflect the genuinely objective world public in full Kantian terms. But that does not mean that any courts, that any courts set up by these institutions will be unilateral either, reflecting only the judgment of one party. It is at least possible that a Kantian approved court could be constituted by a multilateral treaty if the court is set up so that its members are representative, not of the particular party, but are pledged to represent the interests of the whole that is governed by the treaty. So a court whose judges are appointed through a fairly random or rotating process, able to avoid specific individual domination by any one country or bloc, might be said to represent the whole in a way that is more akin to omnilaterality than to unilaterality even though it would strictly speaking still be multilateral and not omnilateral. In the doctrine of right, Kant makes another key point. Basing his claim on the actual States General at The Hague, Kant thinks, quote, they thought of the whole of Europe as a single confederated state, which they accepted as arbitrator, so to speak, in their public disputes, end of quote. Such a Congress then, functions as an arbitrator, which is in essence a private judge, not necessarily a state functionary, but someone chosen to represent an impartial point of view, different from the subjective judgments of the parties to the dispute. In the earlier essay, Idea for a Universal History, Kant likewise suggests that a step from constant war toward the international cosmopolitan condition of a League of Na Nations would be one in which disputes among states are settled by other states acting as arbitrators. Quote, these states will be urged merely through danger to themselves to offer themselves even without legal standing as arbitrators and thus remotely prepare the way for a future large state body. End of quote. Kant does suggest then that states themselves are able to defer to the judgment of an independent objective arbitrator without the need for coercion. A court created by multilateral process would then have that status. And enforcement. The third main area in which Kant's view of right affects international law is his insistence that public right must be enforceable. Since a league of states or any treaty created entity are voluntary and a state may leave them at any time, there is no international enforcement mechanism. Hence, any decision by an international court would lack the addition of enforcement by an executive power and presumably then a rightful Kantian international judiciary would be impossible. But I think that there are three reasons to think that enforcement is not an obstacle for Kantian support of some international courts. First, many of the courts in existence today, such as the trade courts governed by the World Trade Organization, do in fact have some enforceable results. States that violate the trade rules face trade restrictions. While of course those states themselves are always free simply to refuse to trade, they do suffer negative consequences. The enforcement is not full coercion, but it is more than simply voluntary compliance. Second, Kant does not actually require enforcement if the individuals involved accept the result themselves. In the state of nature, 
while there is no power to enforce objective decisions of right, it is more important that there is no objective decision of right to be enforced. Kant thinks that since in the state of nature, there is no public objective decision-making entity that makes decisions in the name of the people, even if persons in the state of nature are themselves just, they will fail to comply with right because they have only their own individual judgment. If some objective entity is created that can make objective judgments and people then voluntarily follow those judgments, then they are implementing right, even if they cannot coerce compliance, but only have voluntary cooperation. Kant thinks that an objective judge without enforcement powers is still short of what is required since compliance with any objective decision about right would be merely contingent rather than guaranteed, but the situation would still be one that implements right. Kant even suggests this in The Perpetual Peace when he says, quote, what holds in accordance with natural right for human beings in a lawless condition that they ought to leave this condition cannot hold for states in accordance with the right of nations, since as states, they already have a rightful constitution internally and hence have outgrown the constraint of others to bring them under a more extended law governed constitution in accordance with the concepts of right, unquote. And for this reason, a league of states is needed, quote, without there being any need for them to subject themselves to public laws and coercion under them as people in the state of nature must do, end of quote. While Kant's league itself is voluntary so that states may join and leave at will, they are able to commit themselves to deferring to the decision of the league. Kant thinks that states will find it in their interest to resolve disputes through negotiation and peaceful settlement rather than war. So if states are capable of voluntarily deferring to the league in Kant's view, then he certainly would hold states capable of deferring to a world court that itself lacked enforcement powers. This situation is what we now face with the International Court of Justice, an arm of the United Nations. States may take their cases to this court, for example, over boundary disputes, and voluntarily defer to the judgment of the court. Of course, both states involved have to agree to follow the judgment in order for it to work. But the general idea of voluntary compliance with the judgment of an international court is feasible for Kant. And third, the third point about enforcement. Kant might accept that individual states could enforce international law as determined by objective judgments, individual states. Lack of an international executive to coerce enforcement does not mean lack of coercive power overall, since a powerful state or a collection of powerful states could have sufficient means to enforce judgments. What I mean here is not the subjective judgment and enforcement of one state or an alliance's claims about international law. I've already shown that's not Kantian. Kant would see all such actions as wrong because the judgment is unilateral, not objective. What I mean instead is something closer to the practice of individual states using coercion to enforce the binding resolutions of the Security Council of the United Nations. In these cases, the individual states are adopting the role of an international executive to enforce the objective decisions of the international institution. The enforcement of objective judgments here is done by individual states in the name of the International League and not as independent states. I think that Kant would accept such a role as rightful only with the following limitations. The decisions would have to stem from a voluntary league of which all involved states are members. The targeted state would have to desire to maintain its membership in the league. So it wouldn't just voluntarily leave. The use of force by particular states would have to be strictly limited by the league. And there would have to be public declaration that the use of force is only in the name of the league. These limitations would ensure that the enforcement action was in reality an act of the league itself within its proper sphere by means of the use of its members' forces. 
But since Kant views the League itself as a voluntary organization, mainly involving states willing to subject themselves to the judgment of others, voluntary compliance, it is not clear that Kant would endorse any use of coercion to enforce international judgments in a league. Unnecessary. So conclusion. I've reviewed three aspects of Kant's view of the judiciary to apply them to contemporary international courts. Regarding the specific application of positive law, Kant would be hesitant about the lingering use of opinio juris and custom, but would support court rulings based on treaty law. Regarding objective judgment, Kant would support courts that act as arbitrator, even though they are not completely expressive of the omnilateral will of the whole. Regarding enforceability, Kant would hope that states would voluntarily comply with decisions, but would recognize that not all states have reached the point of internal justice to allow it. While the current international court systems are imperfect, they do reflect enough elements of Kant's theory of right that I believe he would support much of what they are and do. Now we have 10 minutes for discussion, uh, Efrain, and then, mm -hmm. yes. Thank you for your very interesting talk. Uh, just two points, uh, I'm not sure how to put it because it's not a criticism, uh, about coercion and about uh, how different states can be coerced by one or not, right? So uh, my idea is that there is an alternative to vertical coercion. In other words, you said that the, the, the way to transmit or to, to, to get from international law to local law and, and its enforcement is via the local government. So that prompts, prompts the idea, the, the question uh, whether there could be a sort of coercion which is not vertical from the authority to the subject, but that could be more a horizontal kind of coercion, not among not, not, not among uh, states, but among citizens. And this gets me to the other point. Uh, would you think that there is in, in perpetual peace and Kant's writings space for a kind of transnational political participation? In other words, that uh, the citizens of one country could uh, vote on something that would affect the citizens of another country. Yeah, so uh, here I'm, I'm going to refer back to Gunter Zoller's uh, answer. In terms of cosmopolitan right, which is where citizens of the world somehow are in relation to other citizens of the world and to other states, um, I think that Kant has very little there regarding positive law. I think in terms of the cosmopolitan relations, he takes that to be um, maybe almost a moral requirement for states. Uh, so in terms of the international, uh, whether citizens of the world would somehow be able to relate to one another or, uh, or to an uh, international entity, uh, I'm not, not sure if he would do that. And uh, Gunter's point about um, a, a somehow direct representation at an international level uh, is, is an interesting thing that goes beyond what kind of said. Um, regarding the first point about uh, the vertical uh, and horizontal. So when it comes to international relations, um, a horizontal enforcement would have to be if there was an international entity, I'm sorry, vertical enforcement would be if there was an international entity that itself could enforce decisions against particular states. And I'm not talking about, I mean, I haven't talked about the way in which in international law, in international criminal law, Sometimes individual members of some states are accused of human rights violations and the international organization will try to directly apply law against those individual citizens. I'm more worried about the level of, that Kant was more worried about regarding state relations to other states. So there the question is, would we have a horizontal enforcement where one or more states would operate to enforce through embargoes or military force some judgment um, and I think Kant would be reluctant uh, unless it was really done in the name of the international organization. So he, in, in terms of say enforcing security council resolutions, uh, it would have to be that the states are authorized directly by the United Nations and in some way 
under the United Nations direction. So thanks, that's very interesting. I have a, a small question about customary law um, and your claim that content re reject international court, any use by international courts of customary law. But I'm wondering about cases where, um, like with the ICJ statute, for example, um, the International Court of Justice claims jurisdiction and, and the, the states who have voluntarily uh, agreed to jurisdiction by the ICJ agreed to the statute which says we incorporate customary law. Uh, so there's, you know, there's a little bit of writing which seems to be important uh, for your view, which says, you know, we hereby incorporate by reference customary law. And then, and then there's some rules. There's a fairly well worked out body of law of how we figure out what customary law is. You know, this has got to be pretty careful. We got to appeal to only public uh, indications that states are uh, following customary law and not just merely going on a certain way. I was wondering, I mean, is that enough to make it the case that customary law, even if uncodified uh, in its details, counts as the kind of positive law that a court can legitimately enforce? No, that's a very good point. Uh, and, and so uh, in that same treaty that created the court, uh, it mentions um, opinio juris, it mentions specific treaties, it mentions customary law, and it also mentions you could go even beyond that and the courts can consider things like writings about international law. And you think parentheses, maybe by Kant, right? Um, so uh, yeah, I have to think more about that because in that case, you would have a voluntary um, agreement by the states to be subject to a court that would then invoke customary law. Uh, and, and that might be enough uh, for that. But I, I think Kant would still be quite hesitant in allowing a court to just use just use customary law and not somehow uh, use treaty law or other specific laws that are codified with reference to customary law. So you might be able to a court, I think Kant would be more likely to accept a court saying we are invoking customary law as a way to interpret the codified law, something like that. No, that's a very good point because is the voluntary compliance by the state a compliance to the entire judicial system that would include customary law, or is it a voluntary compliance only to uh, the jurisdiction of the court to make decisions, something like that? Okay. We have two questions, please, uh, Professor. Yes. Yeah, so could you repeat to me what was your argument on the ICC? I didn't, I think I didn't get it. So do you the, think can't, uh, how, what do you think can't, how we can't analyze the ICC. Yeah, so uh, to the extent that the International Criminal Court, it, there are codified rules for the International Criminal Court about uh, laws of war and about um, uh, crimes against humanity and things like that. So uh, that I think is, uh, he would uh, allow that. The extent to which the uh, International Criminal Court though has jurisdiction over individuals, it'd have to be that the, those states, Khan would have to say those states of which those individuals are citizens would have to have agreed to the jurisdiction of the court. And I know that, for example, the United States does not, right? Because didn't, right, the United States doesn't want to have people arrested for crimes that have been committed. But if that is the case, then um, isn't there a slight uh, so if that is the case, then that mean that the ICC should be changed from your reading of Kant? Because those who have signed up, say now Putin has the arrest order on Putin, all the countries that have signed up must, they are obligated to arrest him. Um, and, but I think on your account, they shouldn't do that. If I understand you. Really if, if, if Russia is a signatory? Actually. And uh, I don't believe. I, I think it, even if not, I, I think a little bit regardless, they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. On your account, at most, they should only be doing it if uh, the arrest order goes to a country that is a signatory. Yeah, that's what uh, that's what I th <clears throat> excuse me. That's what I think Khan would hold. Yeah, so you would that it, Khan, I think Khan would hold that the um, International Criminal Court could not claim jurisdiction over individuals in states that are not party to the treaty that creates the International Criminal Court. Right. So it would mean that Khan thinks that it's currently set up on. Yes. Uh, Professor Zoller, please. Thanks so much, Fred. I have a question in 
light of what I call the not all earnest character of the perpetual peace piece. I wonder to what extent Kant is really serious about his extremely a priori conception, in particular of uh, international law of uh, um, Volkerrecht, people's law. Uh, he has very derogatory remarks on the standard treatises, especially the Battels of the 18th century on matters of uh, of the peoples and uh, the people's law regarding uh, war and peace. And while he is committed to an a priori system of right, uh, he never anywhere makes clear how this is applied. It applies in the sense that it's valid and needs to be followed. But when you ask yourself, how would you realize that? There is only one indication in the piece that was mentioned already earlier today on the alleged right to lie, where outside of that special issue of lying, he discusses the way in which principles of right are turned into maxims of politics. In particular, that the representative system is a way of realizing the universality of uh, freedom and equality under the conditions of a huge uh, population in uh, a civil body. And in a similar way, you would have to design the politics of international courts. And through those political considerations at a much less metaphysically refined level, develop such a system, perhaps in line with Kant's principles, but not exhausted by those principles and not such that those principles could allow you to generate such a system. So I think there needs to be a conception of an other than ideal sphere in which on the basis of right, political principles are realized. And I would think international courts are a prime example for an essentially political perspective on these legal institutions. That also would justify then that they cannot be done on the basis of right alone. How would you think about this general way of looking at the matter? Um, so that's a very interesting question. It's, it seems to me that uh, what Kant puts forward in, in perpetual peace uh, is essentially natural law. He's saying this is these are broad principles. They're, they're themselves uncodified. And he is hoping that the states and the politicians within the states, and then those states that are uh, Republican governed, would voluntarily subject themselves to these sorts of rules, and they would set up a, some sort of league. Um, and so, uh, to that extent, I think he, since he doesn't discuss the international court system uh, at all, right? And I'm trying to figure out what he might say about it. It seems to me that he would would want to say a court, since a court has to have specific positive law to work on, there would have to be um, actual uh, codified laws stemming from the, uh, the states themselves, the agreement uh, of the states, and then the courts would do it. So uh, it seems, I, I'm not sure if I would interpret it as, as too political there uh, or based too much on even just natural law. I think he's saying there would be the motivation uh, that states, for states to do this for self-interest, uh, but also uh, because it was to sort of be the moral thing to do, but that the actual process would have to be quite legal. Okay, thank you.